Welcome, and thank you for joining us. I'm Judith Graham, and I write the Navigating Aging column for Kaiser Health News. We're here today to talk about ageism and how it runs through the healthcare system. What are some of the signs? Assuming older adults are incompetent or cognitively compromised, not listening to them, not involving them in decisions, um, um, not treating them as fully human, treating them um, as if they could not respond um, and explain their own desires for what they want in terms of their care, not teaching medical students, therapists, nurses about how to best to care for older adults, not enrolling older adults in clinical trials. I could go on. About one in five Americans um, adults report experiencing ageism in the healthcare system. And at least one study has estimated that that costs the healthcare system $63 billion a year. What can and should we be doing to confront this? Our conversation is gonna be organized in three parts. First, we'll talk about what ageism looks like. Second, we'll talk about the impact of this form of ageism in healthcare settings on older adults' health and well being. Third, we'll talk about what we can do about this. What can individuals do? How can older adults and those who care for them respond when they encounter ageism? What should medical providers and institutions do? This is going to be a series of questions and answers. Um, we want you to participate. Please send in your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the, your screen. We'll be taking your questions throughout this 90-minute session. During our conversation, all the people attending this session will be in listen-only mode. After the event, a recording will be available for viewing anytime at the Kaiser Health News website, as well as kff.org, the website of the Kaiser Family Foundation. We'll also email a link to everyone registered here. Now I'd like to turn to Ronnie Snyder, Vice President for Program at the John A. Hartford Foundation, a co-sponsor of this event, and a longtime supporter of KHN's journalism on aging and health issues. She'll provide some introductory remarks. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, and thank you to Kaiser Health News. Um, the Johnny Hartford Foundation is really proud to support today's event and the KHN reporting desk that covers aging and health issues broadly. Um, so as Judy mentioned, I'm Ronnie Snyder. I'm the vice president for program at the Johnny Hartford Foundation. And we are a nonpartisan national philanthropy. We're based in New York City, but we operate nationally. Um, and our mission is to improve the care of older adults. And we do that by working in three priority areas, um, building age-friendly health systems, supporting family caregivers, and supporting serious illness and end-of-life care also. So um, I really want to welcome everyone for joining uh, our discussion today about ageism in healthcare and what all of us, whether we're patients, whether we're family caregivers, whether we're clinicians, can do about it. Um, we know, and Judy mentioned, that ageism or discrimination based on age is pervasive and pernicious, and it has a profoundly negative effect on our health, ultimately. Um, a global systematic review of over 400 different studies from 45 countries found that in 96%, 96% of those studies, ageism was associated with worse outcomes in all of the health domains examined. I'm just going to pause there for a second because that's striking. Um, ageism leads to all kinds of over and under treatment of older adults, like Judy mentioned, fewer professionals specializing in geriatric care. Um, and the pandemic showed us how we as a society undervalue older adults and the people who care for them as well, which I know our panelists are going to touch on today. Um, to counter ageism, the John A. Harper Foundation has invested in, in several efforts, including the Reframing Aging Initiative at the Gerontological Society of America. Um, it's also why we support the spread of age-friendly health systems that use evidence and not assumptions and biases to ensure that all of us get the best health care, the care that we need as we get older. 
So um, I hope you'll look for information about both reframing aging and age-friendly health systems to help us spread the word about them. Um, you're in for a lively discussion today. I think it's gonna be really rich with this um, group of esteemed panelists. It should be practical also. Um, and I wanna point out that although the clinicians on this panel um, are all physicians, care of older adults is such a multidisciplinary field. There are nurses, there are social workers, physical and occupational therapists, pharmacists, and, and lots of other clinicians and staff who are, really are just as susceptible to ageist beliefs and actions. So we all have a role in countering ageism in healthcare in all areas of life. And we wanna thank everyone in the audience for joining us. Um, we wanna continue this conversation with the foundation and KHN. So I'm gonna turn it back to Judy, an extraordinary journalist who writes the Navigating Aging column for Kaiser Health News. And I hope you all saw her article yesterday it was called, um, They Treat Me Like I'm Old and Stupid. And it featured examples of older adults experience exactly the kinds of age-related biases in healthcare. And it's right on point. So thank you, Judy. And we hope everyone enjoys the session. Thank you, Rani. Now to introduce our panelists. Um, Dr. Louise Aronson is a geriatrician and professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. She's the author of the bestseller, much acclaimed, book, Elderhood. Dr. Michael Wasserman is a geriatrician who's been a prominent advocate for older adults during the coronavirus pandemic. He's the leader of the Public Policy Committee for the California Association of Long-Term Care Medicine. Dr. Javette Orgain is a family physician who's currently medical director of the Longevity Health Plan of Illinois, which serves nursing home residents. She's a former president of the National Medical Association, an organization representing African-American physicians and their patients. Dr. Rebecca Elon, a geriatrician, also has significant experience working in long-term care. She's a current caregiver for her mother who has dementia and her husband who passed away during the pandemic. And she's the only panelist currently living in a senior living facility, if I'm correct. Jess Maurer is a lawyer and executive director of the Maine Council on Aging, which is promoting an anti-ageism pledge. She's an expert in mobilizing communities to dismantle ageism. Let's begin for all of you with an introductory question. Um, please tell us about an experience of ageism in healthcare that you've never forgotten. What happened and what did you learn from it? I'll go in the order in which I introduced you. First, Louise. Ah, well, um, I guess I would say it was probably the experience that made me into a geriatrician. Um, some people may recognize it from early in elderhood. I was taking care of a woman in her 80s um, who became depressed. Um, she was caring for one of her siblings who had dementia and that was becoming increasingly hard. Um, and then she had to put her sister into a care home because she was this tiny woman and she, she literally just couldn't physically do it. Um, and I was a, new, a relatively new doctor. I prescribed her one of the new medicines that were touted, you probably heard of them these days, SSRIs. So things like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, et cetera. And we were so excited by these and I had given them to other patients in my internal medicine practice. Um, and it, the, the, the big excitement was that these were newer and safer. They didn't have side effects. It was great. You know, they had some minor things, but nothing important. So I gave it to her. She got worse and worse. So she ended up having to go into the psychiatry hospital. Um, that evening, the psychiatrist called me because she had, <laughs> she actually wasn't that depressed. She was sad about her sister, but the medicine I had given her had lowered the sodium in her blood something that we now know commonly happens with these medicines, but that we didn't know happened at that time because there were no older people in the studies of these drugs that were supposed to be so safe. So she got transferred to the medical service where we treated this, but that was where I learned that all the medicines I, were prescri I was prescribing for my older patients, not one of them had been in trials of older people. And that really changed my career 
because it turned out I was harming other people in all kinds of ways that nobody talked about um, or acknowledged in ways that were blamed on old age itself, not on the failure of research to include a critical population um, in its studies. Thank you, Louise. Um, moving on to you, um, Mike. What so about an experience that radicalized you? Yeah, this one's easy. I uh, happened a couple of decades ago. Uh, one of my 95 year old patients had come to the office for a visit. And during her visit, uh, she was complaining of chest pain. And we immediately sent her across the street to the hospital where she was admitted. She actually had a small heart attack. When it came time for discharge, the nurse, she told the nurse, my car is parked across the street at the doctor's office. I need to go get it. And the nurse said to her, sure, honey. And they took her downstairs in her wheelchair and left her at the front thinking someone's going to pick her up. It was really a whole mess. Fortunately, a very nice gentleman asked her what was going on. And she said, my car is parked across the street at my doctor's office. He went, got the car, brought it back. So she was able to, to get home. But the sure honey is part of the infantilization of older adults. I was so livid. I, I went to the director of nursing. I went, and, and ultimately this led me to give a presentation to all the nursing staff on ageism in healthcare. And uh, this, this happens a lot. Um, absolutely, we call that elder speak, and it's pernicious. It's it's everywhere in healthcare. Um, Javette, tell us about an experience that you had of ageism and what you took from it. Well, good morning, all, and thank you, Judy, for the invitation. I have also I have been practicing with Vitas Healthcare, the largest um, hospice in uh, the country. And so along with Longevity Health Plan of, of Illinois, I've had some experience in, in, in this arena. I also practice in an underserved area in Chicago and I began caring for older adults prior to becoming a physician. So I had some experience there that fostered my love for the care of the elderly. Initially, I was recruited to be a paid caregiver for an elder tenant of my sister friend's mother. And uh, what I experienced there, even before becoming a, a physician, was her isolation, her lack of caregiving by her family, and therefore her depression. And what I, what I saw and didn't recognize at the time was just some of that meanness uh, that can be shown when you're alone and isolated. So that was my first experience. And I must also bear witness to my own biases expressed when as a physician in training and a new practicing physician, I may have undervalued the practice of those senior physicians with whom I was practicing. I was a young physician, thought I knew more. And uh, so, as, as I became the older and senior physician, I recognized how I had been acting and hopefully that I was not too disrespectful to them during that practice. And then my second um, experience involves being insulted and accused by a senior physician of attempting to take their position when in fact, it was not me or my activities, but an organizational attempt to encourage that physician to resign. So we have those experiences that are quite, quite common in the workplace. And so, so, so those, and this may be ageism, but as an older physician myself, I've recruited a younger physician to take care of me as I age. So, so those are my experiences. Nothing ageist about that. I just wrote an article about losing longtime physicians and many older adults wrote in and said, I'm gonna get a young one because I don't wanna make another change like this again. Jess, tell us about your, how uh, an experience of ageism that shaped you and, and your thoughts about caring for older adults. 
Sure, and I'm, I'm actually going to um, go to uh, a very recent um, uh, example, and uh, I have so many uh, that I could share, um, but I'm really going to highlight an experience with systemic ageism, because I think it's important to talk about, um, and that's really the lack of investments in the systems that support healthy aging uh, and address the needs of older people that are changing as they age. Um, here in Maine, and obviously in many parts of the country, this failure to invest in supports has resulted in um, what we call here in Maine a complete market failure of our care system. Um, so despite intense years of effort to uh, increase funding for what we call direct care workers or, or essential support workers, um, we just simply can't find them uh, anymore here in Maine. Uh, and so I'm, I'm telling a story about um, uh, that I will never forget anyway, uh, about a, a woman in her 60s um, who was living on a ventilator uh, very well, still living a purposeful um, and engaged life uh, with uh, three caregivers who were providing for her care at home. Uh, and she slowly lost those caregivers uh, and could not find new ones. Um, and which is a, by the way, a problem with, with anyone in Maine right now looking to find a, a home care provider. Um, and so she scheduled an appointment with her hospital to take herself off the ventilator. Um, she essentially scheduled her own death. Um, and before she died, uh, she actually asked if she could have her tablet and used her knuckle to say uh, that she would only, she was only scheduling her own death because she couldn't find home care workers. Uh, and I think it's, 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 it's where we've come to. Uh, and um, I think it's really critically important to tell these stories um, because what I have learned more than anything over the last year uh, is that we don't have any idea what the impact is, what those sorts of impacts are um, on the people who can't get care. Um, and, uh, and the reason that they can't get care is that we have not prioritized uh, this population at all for the kinds of supports and services that are needed. Thank you, Jess. I, I'm going to jump in and ask Javette to address that in underserved communities in urban areas as well, um, the, the, the lack of resources and what that says about how we um, approach our elderly population and what it means for those older adults. Thank you, uh, Judy. Let me just talk about the economics of ageism. We have, uh, in our latest census, we have about 332 million um, persons in the United States. The median income is about uh, 39,000 for the median income. In the areas in which I work, um, the median income is even often half that. And so when you're talking about working with the underserved and in, in healthcare, in the, in the nursing facilities, they are there often because they have no resources, they have no family to take care of them, they um, experience isolation. And just recently, so this panel is timely, here in Illinois, they talked about the issues that we have in regards to our nursing facilities, in regards to the care that's even being pro provided in those facilities. The economics of ageism, what we cannot afford, we cannot afford the, medi the medications. It has been six years in the federal government with our legislators, and we've talked about the fact that people are paying, are not paying for their medications because they must pay for their food and rent. And yet we have not regulated pharmacies and it, it becomes a significant issue when your healthcare is your rent as opposed to the medications that you need. Judy, can I jump in on a, a couple other things there? I was just going to ask you a question, but please jump in. Okay. Um, there are so many ways in which this is sort of structured to, to fail. <laughs> Um, so this is again before Congress, but Medicare is not al allowed to negotiate drug prices currently. Um, so who uses the most drugs? Older people, if they could negotiate, the costs of medication would be significantly lower. Um, as for caregivers, particularly in um, underserved communities, it varies a lot by state and also by county. 
Um, so in California, we do have um, a state program called in-home supported service, supportive services. Now, are they having trouble hiring? Yes, everybody is right now. Um, are they paid a living wage? No, particularly if you live in an expensive city like San Francisco. Um, but there are ways you can structurally make it more likely for somebody to succeed at home um, and not have to go into an institution. Although our governor at the beginning of the pandemic said, well, if people aren't supposed to go see older people in their homes because they, they could bring COVID to them, we'll just cut the whole budget for home care, which would have forced everybody into nursing homes. So we, we quashed that. Um, but the degree to which the people having these conversations don't know what they're talking about is also noticeable. Thank you. A panelist has brought to my attention that I skipped you, Rebecca, in telling your story of ageism. I'm going to ask you to do that and also address a question that I have. Let's step back. What is at the root of ageism in medicine? What fuels it? So tell us about an experience and then tell us about what you've learned during your years in this field, the why of it, the how of it. Um, thank you very much, Judy. Um, when Judy asked us to think of a experience of ageism in medicine, um, the word she used was something that sort of seared onto your brain that you haven't forgotten. And I knew immediately what I wanted to share. And that was something that happened um, 15 years ago when I was, uh, I thought I was speaking the truth of my patients uh, their caregivers, um, and I was sort of scolded and shamed for doing so. And at the time, I didn't realize that a decade or more later, I would actually be personally experiencing that same reality um, as a woman growing older and a wife taking care of an impaired uh, husband, so I was a caregiver. And the aspect of ageism that, uh, that I think this example addresses is um, what we as a group an older group uh, may experience, and actually what anybody who is in a group that's affected by any ism experiences, and that is when we try to express that reality to a member who is, to someone who is not a member of that group, it may be dismissed, sort of like, you know, why are you so worried about that? What's the big deal? Much ado about nothing. And there are times when that reality is actually just discounted. The person who's not a member of a group that's affected by an ism, may not actually believe that that could possibly happen because it's so far out of their own experience of reality. So, um, and what happens to us, to people, um, if you feel that you are embarrassed or shamed or um, not believed when you're trying to express that reality, you just stop talking about it. And you don't want to uh, disrupt relationships. So um, actually with my example today, I thought long and hard about whether I would even share it because I thought, oh, I don't wanna disrupt a relationship. And then I thought, well, but isn't that the underlying problem? And isn't the first step to overcoming ageism, recognizing it and talking about it. And, and you have to do it in a fashion that you don't just blow everything up because then you get further categorized and no one's gonna to listen to you. So here's the story. It's actually shorter than the introduction. Um, so 15 years ago, I was serving on the board of directors of the American Geriatric Society. And I had spent my early career in academia, but I had grown very impatient because I wanted to make a difference in my home community. And so when the opportunity arose to establish a community-based geriatric medicine practice uh, for our local hospital, wow, I jumped at the chance. So AGS in New York got a call from CNN that they wanted to do a story about the availability of geriatricians in the community. So AGS sent CNN to our practice, which was near um, Annapolis, Maryland. They took some video, they interviewed some of our patients, they interviewed staff. And in their interview with me, they asked the question, so why does someone come to see a geriatrician? And I knew immediately because I just said, well, people come to us, the experience in our practice is that people come to seek a geriatrician, geriatrics medicine practice, when their needs are not being met in their current primary care situation. So that was less than a five second soundbite. 
And the segment aired a few weeks after the interview. And then a couple of days after that, I got a call from AGS in New York. And they said, Dr. Elon, you have caused quite a problem. And I said, whoa, you know, you know, fill me in. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you have upset a lot of people by your comments. And it was like, I don't understand. Well, they had gotten calls from physician organizations and individuals that I had insulted them by saying that people's needs might not be met as they get older or caregivers needs might not be met um, uh, when they're trying to take care of an older person with dementia or whatever. And so I was, I was sort of scolded and I felt ashamed and I was told I needed to apologize. So, and I, what I would like to say is that it's very important to maintain relationships. And I understand, I love AGS and I understand why they were trying to maintain those relationships. But I also think it's a very fundamental principle here. We have to recognize the reality. We have to be able to speak the reality and we have to be able to respond to the reality. The reality being in this case, that expertise in the care of older adults is um, very, it's not as widely spread as it needs to be. Um, in it's not taught um, widely in medical schools and in other settings, and that um, a lot of work needs to be done in bringing the entire field up. Mike, you have something to say here. Yeah, you, you put your finger on it. Um, the federal government spends $10 billion a year subsidizing graduate medical education. That money comes out of the Medicare program. So we spend $10 billion teaching doctors how not to take care of Medicare beneficiaries. And to your point, what's behind a lot of this, when you get to Congress and the, and the, and the, and the administration, even right now, where are policymakers who have expertise in geriatrics, long-term care, palliative medicine? You're not gonna find them. And therefore, we don't develop policies as a country that are focused on older adults. And you know, just the last comment on this is, many if not all of my colleagues knew in February and March of 2020, the wave that was about to hit older adults in COVID and honestly, the federal government didn't listen. And we now have over half a million deaths amongst older adults from COVID. And close to 200,000 of them are in nursing homes. And most of us in the field expected this and knew it was gonna happen. And honestly, the policymakers, they, they don't seem to care. Um, I, I want to turn to Javette, but I also want to ask a question. I know you have something you want to say. Why don't we care? What is the fear surrounding being old? How does that inform how we, how we craft policies and how we treat older adults in the health system? Javette, on to you. So first, let me comment in, in regards to what Louise and others have been saying. We have uh, approximately 24 specialties of medicine recognized by the American Board of Medical Specialties. In addition, we have more than 100 subspecialties. We are not caring for the whole person we are caring for organ-based medicine. And as a result of that, that impacts the care that we provide. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement talks about the triple aim, that A, we must improve the experience of our patients, B, we must get better outcomes so that the healthcare is delivered, and then C, we still do need to consider the cost of the care. And so the fear in regards to how we handle that is that older persons consume a great deal of the, of the, of the monies related to healthcare. And that's a fear. 
and we don't want to necessarily expend those costs. I think that it's important for us to talk about the fact that we're talking about age, but we don't have that intergenerational discussion. Ageism begins at a young age where the culture is considering their age. Young people are considering their age. Teens are considering their age. And so that is pervasive in our culture. And until we begin to change that dynamic of ageism, then those of us who are older than 65 will continue to have increased discrimination. Jess, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts about how we conceptualize later life and how that fuels ageism in healthcare. And then after your, after your response, I'm going to go to some questions that have come in from our audience. Great. Thanks. And, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's important to talk about uh, ageism as, uh, as cultural. Um, and it is, it's about um, what our society values. It's not about what healthcare values. Healthcare, you know, first of all, humans make up society, you know, and, and so um, it's, it's a human construct we're talking about. And then we're just talking about how that plays out in healthcare. Um, and so I think it's important to look at the much bigger issue, right? Which is that um, as much as we like to romanticize other cultures um, and how they, you know, value or honor older people in those cultures, we don't. Um, we value and honor younger people. Uh, and we have an allegiance in this country. I mean, we pledge allegiance to independence. Um, it, is, it is like a core functioning of our, you know, American view is independence. And we internalize it, we externalize it, we, you know, we put it through its paces everywhere we go. Um, and so when I ask older people, um, what's old and when will you be old? It's always when I can't do for myself. Um, it's always a connection to disability. And I think it's important to look at the historical ways we've treated people with disabilities and older people. I mean, before, you know, a few decades ago, this was just about institutionalizing people. You know, we, if, if you're not valuable to our society, if you're not young and productive, then you have to be put away somewhere. Uh, and, you know, we are slowly evolving that idea, but I think we really haven't as a culture um, been able to integrate this idea of um, disability or normal decline that comes with age to say, you know, to, to make an integrated view of aging, to say, I, I can live a purposeful and engaged life and still need help, right? I mean, we actually, if we looked at our uh, trajectory of aging <laughs> over our lifetime, we need help in all kinds of ways over our lifetime. But somehow when we get to being old, that is equated um, to decline and death. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's important to uh, look at these bigger issues. I'll tell one quick story because, because you said stories are impactful, but I think it's, it's the one that impacts me a lot. Uh, I was speaking about uh, aging um, during to a cohort of health leaders in a leadership class, and I asked them to just uh, work amongst themselves and talk about what, what's your perfect community that you want to live in to age? What does it look like? And, and they did a great job. They reported out all these great things, walkability, you know, public transit, housing, uh, you know, all kinds of housing and, and engagement, socialization. And then three of these nine groups said something like, and then when I can't do for myself, somebody's going to take me out behind the barn and shoot me. And that's, you know, our long-term plan, our long-term care plan is that we so undervalue what we could live, the life we could live, and we only see the we only see uh, as an end for ourselves somebody in a nursing home, and it shows us that we don't value those people when we make those comments. Uh, and so it 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 shows exactly um, why uh, we came to the place that Mike was just describing, um, with so many people dying unnecessarily uh, over the last year, is because we do not value the lives they're living. I said I would um, start questions now, and in fact, the first question that we have speaks directly to this. Of course, um, the, the people want to know what can we do about this. This comes from Karen, and she says, if I hear from my mom's facility or my doc or her doctor one more time, well, your mom has dementia, 
What about the lack of visitation and staff during COVID, the treatment of residents in long-term care facilities, the lack of training and understanding of staff, the confusing agencies and regulations? How, what do we do about about this? How, how do we begin to address the problems that we've be, witnessed so starkly during the pandemic? This um, person addressed you, Michael, so we're going to start with you. Well, I, I'm going to give a few practical suggestions. Um, Congresswoman Mitsui, back in December, wrote a letter asking for a geriatrician to be on the Biden uh, COVID response team. Uh, they've continued to ask. There are still no experts in geriatrics in or long-term care medicine or any of this at the White House. That's You've got to have expertise in order to develop policies. Then number two, all the agencies in the federal government don't necessarily effectively communicate with one another. So you've got CMS and CDC and HHS and again, very few folks at policymaking levels with an understanding of older adults, and they're coming up with um, responses that to the person's question, uh, what, what I've su suggested is there's been sort of the tip of the easy response of let's just lock grandma up rather than try to spend the time, the energy, the policy effort to figure out how to treat grandma with respect and find ways of allowing visitation. So we've really taken as a, as a, as a society and a government, the easy way out, um, easy for everyone, but the folks who are being isolated. Louise, I'm going to um, address this one to you. Um, it just, how can an older patient, this comes from Gail, how can an older patient who believes they are facing ageism in a medical practice address it with the clinician without leaving the practice? Um, and, and especially if someone is complaining about pain or tiredness and they meet a response with, um, they, they're greeted with, what do you expect? You're old, of course, this is the way you feel. Such a good and important question because there aren't going to be enough, there, there just aren't enough geriatricians to switch to. Um, we don't even have primary care right now in San Francisco. So um, anyway, uh, I think you obviously have to do it in a way that they can hear you. And so as with many difficult conversations, probably the best approach is to make I statements. Like I, when you give me that response, I feel um, that I'm not getting the attention, you know, that that my symptoms warrant. Um, I came to you, you know, and I think compliments work. I came to you because you have a reputation as a good doctor. Um, and I really need your help now. I understand that with age, a person can have more pain and more fatigue. And I am concerned that there are diseases, which I know are also more common with age or that, that we might not be uncovering or on the flip side, things we can do to make me feel better, even if we can't find the underlying problem or it's not, you know, the, the risks of treating it aren't really worth it for me. So I think a combination of this is how it feels when you speak to me that way. And I know you're a good clinician and that's why I'm here. So will you work with me on, on this issue? Because I'm really not getting what I need and I have faith that you could provide it, but, but I need you to work with me on this. Thank you, Louise. Very helpful comments. Um, Rita asks, and I'll direct this um, first at you, Javette. Um, can someone talk about the impact of cultural and racial differences in the need for in-home supports and services and address the issue of, uh, this goes to the issue of cultural differences in some communities, caring for your loved one at home is really seen as the responsibility of family and not putting them in an institution. So can you discuss 
that um, and how it plays out in terms of how well members of those communities are cared for? Well, I'm going to begin by saying that you can look at me and see that I am a Black American woman, descendant of Africans brought to the United States as slaves via the transatlantic slave trade. And according to the definition, I'm non-Hispanic Black. And so why is that important? So for Black, Brown, Indigenous immigrants, some of this is challenging in regards to the discrimination. Is it ageism? Is it racism? Is it both or some other ism? And so when you ask the question in regards to, let's further talk about culturally. In reality, if we take a look, um, women are out living men and so are living alone and don't actually have someone who can care for them in the home and are therefore forced often to go into a skilled nursing facility. Others in regards to those who are providing care at home suffer tremendously. And we know that sometimes the caregivers pass before the persons that they are caring for because the support services are lacking. The monetary, resources are lacking in order to care for them in the home. And then that gets us into the cultural bias of not wanting to put them or, or provide palliative care and hospice. So all of the stereotypes in regards to end of life services that might provide better care those stereotypes are there and no, I've had the experience on a new, numerous occasions where people will just say, my dad or my mom are not ready for hospice and we can't discuss that. When in fact, that might be a good alternative, palliative care, when the diagnosis or whatever is going on with your health care is uncertain or we don't have a good answer for you right now. Let's talk about how we can do that in an interdisciplinary team so your, your loved one can get the best care. But people are afraid. In this society, culturally, we cannot talk about end of life. We cannot talk about death. And so those discussions become very difficult. So one of the dilemmas here is that it takes a team to care yes. for older adults. It takes not only family members, friends, neighbors, community institutions, it takes doctors, it takes nurses, it takes physical therapists, occupational spe specialists, speech therapists, social workers. We know that it takes a team to raise a child, it takes a village, it takes the village to care for older adults as well, and our villages are not there in too many instances. Um, Jess, I know you wanted to say something. I also wanted to raise the issue of older adults who are living alone. Huge numbers um, now, especially women in the, in, uh, above the age of 80, 85. Uh, Javette, you mentioned this with, they cared for others and now no one to care for them. So. First, I'm interested in hearing what you wanted to say, and then perhaps we can address the issue of older adults aging alone and the kind of ageism that they oftentimes encounter when they try to get services. So absolutely, and uh, I can address both of those really. <laughs> um, but I, I just wanted to uh, sort of tag on to what Javette was saying, because one of the things um, you know, we, we, we are talking about race uh, and racism there, but, you know, I think I also want to just bring up um, LGBTQ people and particularly transgender people um, who, you know, are experiencing, you know, outright discrimination um, in being able to get into facilities, for instance. Um, but um, one of the things that we see um, is that fear that Javette was just talking about, um, not fear of death, but fear of going into, into an institution or bringing someone into your home um, who's not culturally trained uh, to provide care to you um, if you're a person of color, indigenous person, an LGBTQ person. And so what we see are a lot of people who just don't get the care they need. Um, that fear prevents them. And so then they end up 
in the healthcare system um, because you know they they uh, have um, and of what could have been an avoidable um, health incident because of the very fear that they won't get treated fairly um, and um, that they will experience discrimination if they uh, go into residential care or bring someone to their home. I also just want to say we are doing um, a project here in Maine called the Municipal Data Across Sectors for Healthy Aging, and we've been looking really specifically at the number of people in Maine who live alone, um, and they're about you know we're we're a population of 1.3 um, million. 54 percent of our adult population is over the age of 60. I'm sorry, 50. Oh, 54 percent of our adult populations over the age of 50. We're the oldest state in the country by median age, um, and we have about 83,000 people who live alone. Two thirds of them are women, and um, women uh, live uh, at about 20, the women who live alone have a median income of 22,000. The men who live alone um, have a median income of about 27,000. If you look at the um, National Elder um, uh, Security Index, that means essentially uh, more than 50% of the women um, who are living alone in Maine don't have enough money to meet their basic needs. Um, and so it's definitely something we're re really focused on. And that's just, you know, it's it's historical discrimination grown old. I mean, women leave the workforce to become child caregivers. They leave the workforce to become family care, you know, for care, caregivers for older people. Um, divorce has come along in all of this. Uh, boomers had 10% fewer children than the generation before them. Uh, and so it's really the perfect storm uh, for older people who are living alone, who don't have enough money to meet their basic needs. It means they can't pay out of pocket for anything, not to fix their home, if they're home repair or modify their home, uh, to get home care. Uh, they have to balance whether they're going to heat their homes, take their prescription medications, um, or, uh, or eat. I mean, literally, we see this every day. Uh, and so we need to be looking, we need to be disaggregating age, and we also need to be looking at very specific populations um, and seeing how uh, these, these issues are playing out differently for those people. Another question has come in, and Mike, I'll get to you after this one from Lynn. And I want to address this to Rebecca. It's something we had talked about before this panel. Isn't there an um, intersection between ageism and ableism? I have been blind all my life and all these postures and language issues are evident in healthcare for us. I am nearly 70 now, so I'm blind and older. Let's talk about ableism. We talked about racism and how it intersects and confuses the picture. Let's talk about the intersection of ageism and ableism and define ableism. Sure, when um, people are discriminated against because of certain um, disabilities, uh, that would be defined as ableism. Um, and there certainly is an intersection of ableism and ageism in healthcare. Um, in, in thinking about concrete examples and stories, um, when my husband was disabled and I had to take him to his primary care internist, uh, ableism was evident when there weren't enough uh, parking spaces for um, um, handicapped parking. And it wasn't a matter of I could just drop him off at the door and go park the car and you know take five minutes to walk up because he had dementia. So he would get out of his wheelchair and probably fall and so forth. So, um, so that was the first indication of ableism. And then fortunately they did have a door opener uh, to get into the building, but then the building has this huge atrium and it has uh, an open stairwell, an open staircase, which was beautiful. But then the elevator, we could barely get um, his um, wheelchair and me as his caregiver <laughs> into the elevator. So clearly the architect was thinking about the beauty and not the functionality. And then we get up to the um, medical office and they don't have an automatic opener on the door. So I'm struggling with the wheelchair and the door and none of the staff people came to help us, but fortunately someone else sitting there and waiting came and helped open the door. And then we go up to the counter and of course the counter is higher than he's able to uh, visualize. And that is an indication of ableism. Um, and then at the counter, there are two women looking at a computer and I'm kind of going, um, hello, you know, hello, and they don't respond. And I'm looking around the office, you know, do they have some sort of automated check-in as many offices do now? Well, they didn't, they were just ignoring us. And then um, a young man, he must've been about 45 and six foot two walked up and immediately someone came out and took care of him. And that to me was ageism. And then um, someone finally came up to the desk to deal with us. 
And they didn't look at us, they didn't say good morning, they didn't say hello, they just said name, date of birth, insurance cards. <laughs> and that's not ageism or ableism, that's just rude. And um, then we had to, uh, we had really scurried and uh, it took a huge effort to get there on time. It was a rainy morning and when I had made the appointment six months earlier, um, my husband was in much better shape. So I'm thinking, why did I make an appointment for 9.30? But we got there on time and it took a tremendous effort. And then we had to wait an hour to go back. Well, again, that's not ageism or ableism. That's just lack of concern. That's not patient centeredness, which is considered one of the current um, aspects of quality care. When we finally did get to go back, um, they asked him to stand on a scale, but it was a straight upright scale with, you know, kind of that wobbly platform. And my husband could barely get out of the wheelchair. He certainly couldn't stand on the scale. And that's ableism because, um, you know, they could have done something simple, like even put a walker uh, frame behind the scale to hold on to, um, or have a wheelchair scale or something different. So that's ableism. And then again, the, the size of the exam rooms um, were such that you could barely get a wheelchair in, barely get a wheelchair and a caregiver, and that's ableism. And the, um, the exam table was a step up exam table. So when the doctor came in and he wanted to examine my husband, he said, can you get up on the table? And I'm just kind of thinking, you know, what planet do you live on? But my husband dutifully got out of his wheelchair. He put one foot on the step and then he froze. He couldn't move. And I'm going, he can't get on this table. So in, in most geriatric offices, they'll have a, an electric table. It's much more expensive, but you can lower it. So you can just do a pivot transfer from the wheelchair to the exam table. And then you can do a reasonable exam on your older patient. So as far as ageism, when, um, when we had seen him six months earlier, I had been given a whole packet to fill out going home. And it started with caregiver stress thermometer, you know? And I went home and I looked at the packet and my stress just went way up because I thought, I don't have time to fill all this out. So it got thrown in one of the piles on the desk. So when um, the medical assistant is bringing us into the room, she says, Dr. Elon, she didn't say Dr. Elon, she said, Rebecca, do you um, have your packet? And I thought, oh, the packet. I forgot the packet. And she said, well, that was the whole reason for the visit today. And so she, again, she was scolding me and making me feel ashamed that I wasn't a good caregiver and a good, um, um, I just wasn't good. I was ashamed. I forgot the caregiver survey. And, but for her to say that that was the entire reason for the visit, I was thinking, I was getting a little twinge of anger here. It's like, wait, I thought the purpose of the visit was for you to help me take care of my husband. And while we were waiting an hour to see the doctor, I had written some notes because a lot had happened in six months. His cardiologist had changed some meds. He was having more trouble chewing and swallowing. We had seen the ENT doc because his nose was dripping all the time. We'd seen the speech therapist because he was sneezing and blowing his food during meals and so forth. Um, anyway, I had seven pages, steno pages. And I handed those to the medical assistant she and the doctor sort of did a baton transfer as one left and the other came in. He sat down, he just sort of flipped with his thumb. He didn't read the pages, he flipped the pages and he pushed them to the side and he said, copious notes. He said it out loud. You know, I thought, well, if he had thought that and he pushed him to the side, but he said it out loud. So again, I'm feeling ashamed. She who writes copious notes. And then, um, so he starts giving my husband a mental status exam. What I had written in the notes is, Bill can only speak a couple of words now. So he could have saved himself. Actually, if he had spent a minute and a half just scanning the notes and understanding what was there, he would have saved probably five, maybe 10 minutes in the exam. So I said, well, you know, Bill can't really partake in that exam right now because he can't talk. Okay, so, um, and then he's asking me all the questions that were on that caregiver survey. Um, you know, does, um, is he home alone at all? You know, how's your stress level? Um, are there gaps in service? And when he said, are there gaps in service? I thought, what is he talking about? And I said, what are you talking about? Gaps in service, I don't understand. And he, I was sort of behind his computer and he just checked no gaps in service and went on, he didn't answer my question. And I'm thinking, this is just bizarre. I mean, what, what's going on here? And then he said, um, do you want a palliative care medicine consult for your husband? And I said to him, well, you know, I'm, I'm board certified in internal medicine, geriatric medicine, hospice and palliative medicine. I said, well, what, 
come on, what would that accomplish for us at this point? He already had advanced directives. Um, he had a no resuscitation order. His cardiologist had turned off his um, automatic defibrillator. You know what? And again, he just, he just checked declines palliative medicine consult. Um, you know, do you want a referral to the, um, uh, the county health department for services? And I'm going, don't you know anything about the county health department? It's like, we already have paid services and we wouldn't qualify for subsidized services. I'm a geriatrician, I know what's available. Anyway, at the very end, the very last thing I had written on my notes was that my husband started to cry. He was crying all the time. He was crying and he went to church. He was crying if he saw a sad movie on TV. And I couldn't really talk about this at the time, especially not in front of my husband. But I said, do you think he would benefit from one of those drugs that Dr. Aronson's uh, patient got hyponatremic from? But do you think this might help for some mood stabilization? So I had to bring this up at the end of the visit. And I, I was losing it at that point. I was starting to cry myself. And my husband's looking at me like, what is wrong with you? And I just explained the situation and I'm like losing it. And the doctor, he says, okay, here's a prescription for sertraline, 25 milligrams. I wouldn't go over that dose. That's the maximum dose. He hands it to me and he walks out of the room and he pats me on the back and he says, um, hang in there. He didn't say, when do you want to come back? And I thought, you know, he probably thinks, I, I was thinking he never wants me to come back. She who writes copious notes, you know, she who's getting upset during the visit. Um, so we went out to the desk and the checkout lady said, um, we, do you want to make your appointment now for your six month Medicare wellness visit? And I thought, my husband is dying of dementia and he's changing fairly rapidly and you want to schedule a Medicare wellness visit for six months. So I just said, no, thank you. And we went home and I wrote it all up and I've used it as an example in teaching for what not to do. But it's like everything that was wrong with that visit, I, I was telling a colleague of my husband's and he said, Rebecca, you know, take him back to your practice. Well. I had established the practice like over 20 years ago and I left the practice after 10 years in the hand of a junior partner. But I thought, oh, of course, take him to a geriatrician. <laughs> it's like, duh. And um, everything that I've told you about that visit that went wrong, it was just night and day. And it was just such a breath of fresh air. Fresh air. So I would say if, if a patient or family member is not having their needs met in their current setting, Yes, try to gently raise it with the practice. But if it is so dysfunctional, I mean, there's certain things that can't be fixed and you need to sort of acknowledge that. Call up your hospital CEO, ask, is there a geriatrician? And if they say no, you say, well, why not? And ask your congressman, why doesn't Medicare fund geriatric medicine? You know, and, and we have this sort of inherent ageism about our own profession. We have this mantra, there will never be enough geriatricians to take care of the old people. Why is that? That is not a fact that came down from the mountain. You know, that is ageism in and of itself. And I've talked too much and I apologize, but I thank you for giving me this opportunity. No, thank you so much for sharing your story. It, it sounds horrible. And I saw everybody on our panel nodding vigorously which I assume means you encounter this all the time. And we'll get back to that. But I, a tweet just came in. Um, I'm not, well, I'll read it. Um, it's from Sherry. And she says she has an octogenarian father who's actively dying, um, but still is mobile and lucid, um, suffering from terminal agitation. And the primary care doctor apparently has given her this helpful advice. No screen time, limit food and exercise, and no drinking before bed. In other words, complete gap between the reality of what it means to be at the side of someone who's dying and the needs of the person who's dying and what the the doctor is willing to see and acknowledge. Um, I, who wants to take this one on? I'd like to volunteer, Judy. This is Yvette. 
There are a couple of things in regards to, first, let me just do the, the office visit. One is from a perspective of, of cost. We are dealing with the fact that we are trying to get more patients in. So the 15 minute visit, when in fact for our older patients, we need a half an hour plus in regards to the care. And because of the strains on the system and because of the economic gain that the system is looking at, that is not the case. We've got 15, 20 minute visits when in, in reality, no one should have that much of time in terms of an, of an office visit in regards to what we call quality of care. The other issue for us is, is the fact that for a long time, we had to battle to get compensated for advanced care planning. The fact that we need to be able to have a discussion with the patient and the family and the caregiver in regards to what the goals of care really are. What do you want? The example that you just gave, let's talk about what your goals of care are and have some concrete suggestions in regards to what we recommend. And again, and I'll keep saying this, it still requires a team. I'm a family medicine physician. And what we talk about in regards to academic training, let's begin with our students and residents and continue to train and continue to focus on the whole person as opposed to the organ base. And I appreciate her concern and um, lack of an adequate answer. But let's con families need to be able to sit down and have a discussion. What does your loved one want in terms of care? And consider doing that before they are unable to do it. And so we tend to push those decisions off until a very long time when our, until our family member is unable to tell us. So please, please begin that discussion. It's never too late to begin that discussion in regards to what your goals of care are and to begin to plan for that. What do you want to do? What your bucket list is? And, and so those, those are the recommendations. Mike, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make a provocative statement here. And that is that Javette mentioned the triple aim and costs. If we, what I call geriatricized the entire healthcare workforce, which would stand the medical healthcare industrial complex on end, we would save $200 billion a year. I have no doubt about that. And uh, connecting the dots of what everyone said here today, we can go back about 15, 16 years when the Bush administration passed what I call the Pharmaceutical Industry Windfall Act. One of my patients came to me and said, you know, just before this act got in, it passed, the, my drug, all my generic drugs went up 30%. So what the federal government did was it gave a windfall to the pharmaceutical industry. And that coincides with the fact that if you go back one to two decades, the percentage of cost expenditures in Medicare from pharmaceuticals has gone from approximately 10% to nearly 20%. And when you put that in the context of what Louise said about the fact that no one studies older adults, Medicare is spending 20% almost of its, of its expenditures on pharmaceuticals that have never been tested on Medicare beneficiaries. None of this makes any sense. Louise, Can I, I jump think you in on that. something. Yeah, jump in. Yeah. So on all the money conversations, because even when you can get people to engage in this, which you often can't, I mean, I think Rebecca's story really, the, the, the first physician they went to see is the one who says, I take care of old people all the time. I don't see why we need geriatricians, just to be really clear. Um, so, uh, so how do you pay for all this? Uh, well, there is there are a series of articles. I wish I could say I've read them, but I did note them um, in JAMA this week um, about the huge administrative costs of our healthcare system. If you compare us to other uh, comparable countries, we spend many times more and our outcomes are among the worst of comparable countries. 
Um, so to say there isn't enough money is to not address the fundamental issue, which is that the money is often in the wrong places. Um, for older adults in particular, we can't get people the strengthening exercises that would prevent falls. But if you fall and have a fracture, you can get emergency care that will cost many thousands. You will get a surgery that will cost uh, tens of thousands. You will have hospital and rehab stays driving the bills to hundreds of thousands, whereas the actual rehab you needed to prevent and not all, but many of those would have cost just hundreds of dollars. Um, so we prioritize all wrong. Medicare doesn't pay for things like hearing aids or dental care. Um, I, has anybody ever met a person who didn't want to hear or eat? I, I haven't. Why don't they pay? Because it would cost too much. Why would it cost too much? Because everybody needs it. Um, and then there's the famous argument of, well, we, you know, older people use up too much of the healthcare dollar. So what I would like to say is that is life stage appropriate, right? We have three major stages of life. We have childhood, adulthood, and elderhood. When have you ever heard someone say those children are using up too much of the education dollar? Why are they all so stupid? Why do they require so much education? Um, when do we ever hear about how adults are spending so much money on the military or driving up housing prices, creating the homelessness crisis? We never hear that. That is an injustice and that is blanket ageism. And to blame old people for the failures of our inefficient system, long known inefficient system, is to not address the fundamental problem, uh, which is you know, the ageist structure. And I could go on for about a week, but I'm gonna try and stop now. I'm sure. I wanna bring us back. Um, we have several more questions that have come in, but I wanna bring us back to that thing that we can't stop thinking about, the pandemic. And has it changed the picture in terms of exposing ageism and in terms of motivating people to make, to address it, both in um, long-term care settings and in community settings? I'm going to start with Jess, who's nodding her head vigorously. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I will say, you know, our organization is uh, is almost uh, ten years old. We'll be ten years old next year, and and uh, before the pandemic, uh, while we were um, definitely using the Frameworks Institute, reframing aging. Um, uh, empirical research to to really you know sort of frame our conversations and have robust conversations. Um, COVID hit us over the head uh, with a two by four to say you know you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You have to address the root cause, um, and uh, the root cause here is ageism. Uh, and so in 2021, uh, you know we launched uh, what's called the Power and Aging oh. Project. Uh, and what we're doing is having conversations about ageism. Um, it's a pretty straightforward um, formula because what we know is ageism is bad for us, it's bad for our health, it's bad for the economy. We also know that if you, well, I mean, the empirical research is great. What we know about what Americans think about older people and aging is they don't believe ageism is real. They believe it's an independent, it's a uh, personal problem, right? It's 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 a your problem, an individual problem to solve. Uh, and they believe either older adults are doing really, really well, or they're all dying. There's sort of like no productive thoughts about how people really are aging. Um, and so what we also know is just having a conversation about people's internal, their own age bias, and how age bias impacts everything around them, everyone around them, um, they actually are much less likely to act on their own age bias. More importantly, they are more likely to support systemic changes that are needed in our system. And so we are just doing a pretty basic thing, which is talking to people. We're talking to the media, we're talking to healthcare providers, we're talking to HR directors, who, by the way, are happy to tell us about actual illegal age discrimination happening. Um, and, uh, and I mean, it's fascinating within these conversations um, uh, and, uh, and with many, many others, um, with funders, actually, uh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's 1% uh, of national funding it goes to uh, fund aging issues. Um, so we're very pleased uh, with grant makers and aging for that. So, you know, that's one of the things um, that we are doing sort of how, you know, we've, we've really uh, changed 
I will also say, you know, I just want to put a little plug in for um, the Johnny Hartford Foundation's um, uh, age-friendly health systems work because um, we personally find it to be um, really disruptive of ageism within the healthcare system. Um, because if you ask a healthcare provider um, to deploy what's the four M's, right? It's uh, you know mentation, um, uh, mobility, uh, medication, but most importantly, what matters most it disrupts our, um, our normal patterns of stereotyping people. Um, it forces us to see the person in front of us. And that's really what we've been asking. Like what is holding us back as human beings from seeing the person, the whole person in front of us when we're talking about older people. So I just wanna say there are things we can do and I've been in social change my pretty much my whole career. And I can tell you this is, an issue people get. So you can actually feel good and things actually happen. People make connections. They say, oh yeah. And it's against all of our own self-interest. So we we do have some things we can do. Uh, and so I, I encourage us all to think about the ways we can disrupt ageism in our own worlds. Rebecca and then Louise. Um, as far as the impact of COVID on nursing facilities, um, Mike and others have, have written and spoken very eloquently about uh, the debacle. Um, but the effect on staffing has been uh, horrific. And um, part of the reason that the, part of the reason that there's so much trouble with COVID in facilities is that it's been chronically understaffed. And, and um, you know, there were several reports by the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, looking at quality of care in hospitals and nursing facilities. And it, much of it boils down to staffing. So what would happen is the uh, IOM would make recommendations, they would go to Congress, then they would uh, write bills, they would go to the Office of Management and Budget, they would get um, the financial, side and then it goes back to the financing. Oh, we can't afford to do this. It's too expensive. But um, so many staff just left the nursing facility and COVID has exacerbated the staffing issues in senior care facilities because now there's like this huge additional stigma. Um, and there's the financial stigma that if you if you work in a nursing facility or a senior care facility, you don't make as much as if you would work in a hospital. So people that are concerned about how much money they need to make to support their families and so forth, um, they're gonna go to a hospital. They're not gonna come to the nursing facility. A company that I worked for for many years actually had a nurse staffing office in Manila, Philippines, because they had to bring uh, you know, nurses uh, from out of the country to staff their facilities because in our country, uh, you know, we don't want to do this. So COVID has changed many things, but it has extremely exacerbated the um, issues with staffing that pre-existed COVID. And it should be said that the issues with staffing that are being faced in institutions, um, assisted living nursing homes are also being felt in um, the home care settings. Louise, we have lots of comments and questions about what can be done. We've, we've been defining the problem. We're not done defining it, but let's, let's talk about some concrete actions um, that people can take um, that might be able to make a difference. Terrific. Um, I love all these questions and comments. So somebody also noted that Biden was talking about uh, Medicare support for hearing aids, glasses, dental, et cetera, mm -hmm. but they don't know what happened with that. I think it was among the stuff in the huge bill. Um, you know, we're, we're at a difficult moment in the nation's history, to, you know, like, I don't even know how to address that, but um, continuing to show enthusiasm for those things to your Congress people um, and to the federal government. Um, you could have an email that you send weekly, you know, just make one and just keep sending it to everybody. So you don't have to spend your time, just have it be what you do, you know, every Tuesday at 9 a.m. or something like that. Um, to show ongoing enthusiasm, because if it doesn't make it in one bill, it might make it in another. Um, there is also something called HR 3733, which is an essential caregiver bill um, because caregivers were shut out um, of facilities. Um, there was a misunderstanding well, actually, there was a complete lack of understanding of what happens in these facilities. I will say I deployed for the city of San Francisco and the state of California, and none of the people at the top of the public health ladder could define long-term care. 
They didn't know what assisted living was. They didn't know what board and cares were. They didn't understand that most long-term care was actually in the home provided by family and paid caregivers. They literally didn't understand. So what we spent most of our time doing, it was hard to move any policy forward because they kept deploying different people and we would have to educate everyone um, about who was there and know there aren't nurses there and so on and so forth. Um, meanwhile, the people who did understand not only the facilities, but the individuals within them and their very particular needs, physical, social, psychological, emotional, um, were not allowed in. Um, sort of, and, and almost obscenely, if you were a paid caregiver from a staffing agency, you were allowed in. But if you were the spouse, the daughter, the son, you were not allowed in. That's obscene by every culture I've ever had an interaction with. Um, so, so, so support this bill. I got a little digressed. Sorry, I get, I get a little overwhelmed by that. I will also say that hospitals um, were allowing in the parents of sick kids, the partners of women who were giving birth, um, you know, but, but no one um, care partners of people with dementia who are most likely to actually um, then be drugged and tied up when sick. Um, so contact your system, all, your health system all the time or your health provider and really say like, what do you mean you have specialists in every other age group? Like you can say, I would understand if you didn't have specialists in age, age groups, but, but you actually do. So I'm wondering why you don't have one for me. Um, you know, create community groups that take action. Right, so we can have age-friendly communities, World Health Organization and others have some really good information on this. And whenever anything is up locally, make sure they're thinking not just about kids and adults because they're gonna have that covered, but think about elders too, because it's the only way we really transform. And then I guess the final thing, you know, our major leaders in Congress and the White House are themselves elders. But we don't hear a lot about that, right? Because the only way they keep their jobs, I mean, think of all the jokes about Biden. Um, only way they keep their jobs is to pretend that isn't happening. And we all know they've spent, most of them have spent a great deal of money to look younger than what they are, which is fine. Like everybody has the right to feel good about themselves. Um, but, but that's how we make things worse. So if we can all own our age and say, this is one of the ways, one of the very many ways this age looks, you know, and it matters. I think then we help create a less ageist society. Javette, I think you um, um, indicated you might have some thoughts here. I think that the pandemic has exposed the gap in technology for sure. I, and, and, and from a perspective of a solution, we should be talking about intergenerational interventions where seniors are living with younger, uh, persons so that they can get that kind of support that they need as they continue to advance, particularly for those who are for seniors. So therefore that means that we have to create, as Louis said, those environments and those living situations and how we uh, now build as opposed to building such that we are divided from each other, but we are connected. I think that the, the technology gap is significant. Many of us go to our youth to say, how do, you, how do you do this? How do you fix this? How do you deal with this? But if, for instance, all of us now have my chart, but many of our elders don't know how to access my chart, don't know how to navigate the technology that's required. And particularly during the pandemic, when you couldn't see anyone, the technology was not available in a nursing home to allow them to at least see them via the technology, via the iPad, via the computer, via FaceTime. And, and many organizations have used those tablets to take them into the home, but that's not general. So we have a significant technology gap. And I think that the pandemic has exposed that as well. And uh, let's, uh, before I turn to Mike, let's not forget all the signup systems for COVID vaccines that required people to go on websites that were yes. impossible to navigate Yes. Um, and that, of course, people, you know, who had vision issues couldn't see. I mean, it, it was a nightmare um, mm -hmm. and uh, for older adults um, and entirely insensitive to their unique needs. Mike, your thoughts about how the pandemic is going to play out perhaps in, in terms of 
influencing policy and attitudes toward care for older adults? So I, I think the pandemic, the, I keep looking at this because I'm a glass half full kind of a person, believe it or not, is, is that uh, it, there's a silver lining is we're talking about ageism. We are, we've seen what's happened due to ageism. That can be good, but it can also be a huge opportunity lost if we don't do something about it. And, you know, as I listen to everyone talk, I just continue to be reminded that having policymakers at the federal, state, and local levels who have expertise in geriatrics, so we're talking geriatricians, we're talking geriatric nurse practitioners, social workers, pharmacists, therapists, the whole realm of expertise has to be, if it's not, if we don't have people in policymaking positions with this expertise, nothing is going to change in my opinion. And, and I, I really am worried about that. And so that, that I think, and I, I wanna make one last comment that I, uh, Javed had made a comment and so it just, I don't think it's coincidence that we have the great disparity in life expectancy between people of color and and those and and whites and and people with money and those without money and you know when we start looking at long term care services and all that and we look at pharmaceutical costs it doesn't take a genius to connect all these dots and realize yeah people of color aren't going to live long, as long as other people who have means and wherewithal and resources and it's about damn time we do something about it. An incredible segue into our next, uh, another question that came in, which is how does class, and I assume what they mean here is socioeconomic class, um, play a role in or intersect with ageism? Um, we've talked about um, racism intersecting with ageism and Mike, you just talked about, uh, you mentioned this. Let's look a little bit more depth about the, those who um, are at the bottom of the income ladder or close to the bottom and how ageism might affect them differently. Who wants to, Jess, you're nodding your head. You have thoughts? Well, you know, it, it's it, I mean, it's absolutely true, and and uh, you know, we're when <laughs> we're digging deep into individual communities. I mean, that's one of the bigger challenges that we see is you know, you, we only have community level data, and we're a very rural state. I mean, co county level data, and we're a very rural state. Um, and so when you when you dig deep on some of the demographics, um, for instance, we have one community. Uh, our, we have a you know, well, one of the challenges in in this country, right, is that Social Security masks poverty of older people. I just want to say that like right out loud, um, you know, here in Maine, but I also know nationally, um, they're, you know, somewhere between 30 and 40% of older people are living on social security alone with a, a very low social security level, maybe $16,000. Um, what, so that's just, it's like 125 or 130% of the federal poverty level. So we look at poverty, 100% of federal poverty level, and we say, you know, 8% nationally of older people are poor. So that, that, you know, that's not as bad as kids. It's not as bad as adults, you know, but we're not looking at this gap between um, folks who don't have enough money to meet their basic needs and, um, and don't qualify for any means tested benefits. And we are not as a nation investing in services or tiered services where people, I mean, people want to pay. That's what I know about older people. They don't want to hand out. They, you know, they want to pay for things, um, but they can't. They can't afford to fix their homes. They can't. So this is what we see all over, at least in our state, Maine, are that people are living in homes that are, they, you know, keep at 50 degrees. They, um, you know, eat once a day. Uh, they prioritize their medication. They don't go out, which makes them more socially isolated. Um, and their homes are falling down around them. And there are no, um, uh, definitely not low income. You can't get low income housing in Maine, you know, but we have a 10,000 person wait list for affordable uh, housing for older people in Maine. And they're waiting three to five years. And so what people are doing is they're holding on. And this is class. I mean, this is definitely, I'm talking about, you know, the this, these are, um, you know, lower middle class to lower income folks just can't access anything. They can't afford to pay out of pocket for it. 
and uh, and they, you know, it's harder to find workers in in this workforce problem. They just let stuff go. Uh, and again, you know, this this gets goes back to cost, right? Because we're not investing um, in and in focusing on lower income older people and this infrastructure need, um, they it, it results in healthcare. I'll tell you one quick story. There's a woman in my community. Um, where I live, who um, had uh, COPD and she had mold in her basement because um, of her foundation um, had, had fallen in. There's standing water in her basement and the previous guy had had pit holes in the floor to get more heat into the upper. So, so she developed mold and every time the heating system came on, mold came up into her house. And so she had been hospitalized 10 times um, from the time we found her in, in who she came into a volunteer home repair program. And the last time she'd been hospitalized for um, 10 days and the cardiologist or the pulmonologist said, if you go home, it will kill you, right? But she was very low income. Her home was her only place to go. There was no other place for her. And so she went home and we had a group of volunteers who fixed her home for $2,000 and you know, came in and did all of the work. She was never hospitalized again and came off oxygen. You know? And you think about what the cost of that was to the health system versus this $2,000. We're just prioritizing the wrong things and it's resulting in human misery and higher costs. We have about five minutes left. So let me um, pose a question like we did at the beginning and go around. If you had to name, let's say, three priorities um, uh, for action over the next year or the, the, the near term future for seizing this opportunity, as Michael said, when ageism is now actually on the radar screen, we, we've talked some about that. If you want to repeat yourself, fine. What would those be in terms of what we should be doing next? Um, Rebecca, it's been a while since we've heard from you. Why don't you start? Um, I would say that when uh, people's needs aren't being met, when caregivers' needs aren't being met, um, don't just bury that. Acknowledge it, write it down, and communicate that to people that you think uh, might be able to make a difference. Um, if it's in healthcare, start in your local setting, ask the questions. Um, gather together in groups uh, because groups generally can have a, a louder voice than individuals. Um, and if it's political, carry it forward in the political environment. Judy, yes. Yes, I'm going to have to intervene because you, it can't be three things. It's going to have to be one thing because we only have three minutes left and the time is so put caregivers on the radar screen and their needs because they are, are the backbone of our support system for older adults. Louise. Make a ton of noise and don't shut up until things change. Everywhere you go, every day, every situation, social, professional, political, in your community and nationally, just keep making noise. That's how other social change movements succeeded. Own it, be noisy, let's do it. Mike. Similar to those, especially those of us in this field, speak truth to power, do not be shy. Rebecca, Rebecca led us on that earlier on today. So thank you. Javette. Increased funding for home-based care and the improvements in skilled nursing facilities. And Jess. Uh, what everybody else said and um, include age in every equity conversation we're having, every diversity, equity, including uh, judgment, uh, equity, uh, inclusion, and justice conversation we're having. Age has to be a part of the conversation, and that will help us move collectively together. And of course, others have noted that this is the only ism that affects all of us because we are all going to grow old. And so we all have a stake in the outcome. It's 11, uh, 11.30 my time, it's 1.30 Eastern time. Our panel has been wonderful. Thank you all so much. 
Uh, thanks to our attendees for coming. Remember, this is going to appear live on the Kaiser Health News website and Kaiser Family Foundation website. Thank you all. Thank you for the invite. Thank you so much. Good to see you all. Bye-bye.